He has been awarded the highest honors of his profession, including the Aga Khan Award for Architecture, the Premium Imperial of Japan, and the Gold Medals of the UIA and the Royal Institute of British Architects. Mr. Korea, we are absolutely delighted to have you here, and we request you to take the dance. Well, thank you very, very much for asking me here, the students, the faculty. Ahmedabad means a lot to my wife and me. I think it's been, it was the start of the buildings I did in my career. I think Ahmedabad gave, you know, Bombay is a city of money and commerce, so is Ahmedabad. But Bombay has capitalism, which is, I would call, bourgeois capitalism. They never take a chance. Ahmedabad has venture capitalism, and that made a difference. And people here would take a risk. And I read somewhere, I think, someone said, Cocteau said that all art is taking a risk. When your friends tell you stop, it's perfect, that's when the true artist begins. And um, Ahmedabad had that quality. I think that's how Doshi or Kanvindi or Ashmukh they could, we could, uh, we could get projects in the sense that clients were much more trusting and much more adventurous. You, I've read things where they said, without an avant-garde, you cannot have artistic venture. And today, I, this morning, I was with Kira Sarabhai. Even at this age, the kind of in energy she puts out and concern. It was wonderful, actually wonderful. So thank you very, very much. It's, for me, it's a great thing to come back here. Now, the, my, my uh, talk today, also I want to say one thing. I remember when the school was in a, in a badminton court. So I'm really, congratulations to you people. You all have now made it the best school in India. And I think better than that. So let's clap ourselves. <laughs> I think everywhere people are not only they're very proud of SEP, then that's wonderful. And I say it's wonderful, Ken. Congratulations to all of you who make it possible. Now, my my uh, talk this evening is on architecture. And um, well, there's something on the screen. Okay, good. Um, our, our architecture is it's not like music. You know, music is a portable feast, a great pianists like Rubenstein or Ravi Shankar or the sitar, they can play the same concert in New York and the next day in Manas and the jungle, next day in Tokyo, but not architecture, because a building is rooted to the soil on which it sits. You could not take this building and turn it around 90 degrees to get the sunlight differently. It's rooted in the soil, in the climate, in the culture, the, in the aspirations of the people who live in it. And though that makes it completely different from the other arts, I think. And that's what that's such a wonderful sentence of Norbert Schultz. He says, place represents that part of truth that belongs to architecture. So we see then, I see at least architecture as revealing a truth, some truth about what the, what the problem is, like it could be a truth about the structure of the building, it could be a truth about the, um, the materials used, it could be a truth about the function, or it could be a truth because it's, it's a metaphor for something else, which is very, very important. Architecture has always been concerned, not only with the problems it solves, but what it represents in the mind. So. I'll start with what I think are some of the truths from which architecture divide, de, uh, derives its strength <laughs> and its meaning. The first one I would say is that form follows climate. This is the Alhambra in, in Spain. And you can see how beautiful it is, these pools and, and the garden. And uh, tomorrow you go into a five-star hotel and you'll see the same thing in the lobby. But it's, it's completely meaningless here. You are really looking at a machine for dealing with climate. 
this is the hot desert sands of winds come in and sand too, I guess, and these walls block it out. So the, the air which is then in the courtyard is then humidified so it gets cooler. So the very shape of the building is what deals with climate. I don't just design a glass tower and use low E glass and therefore get a Leeds award. I mean, it's sad. You hear the imagination of the architect is involved in the shaping of the building to deal with climate. That's probably one of the most profound of all the form makers, climate. Here's another example of climate we all know. This is the Red Fort. Here, the, well, I'll show you. You go through this thing, as you all know, and then you can see the wall has got bigger openings on the terrace level and then smaller windows down. Now, these are the pavilions, which are on the terrace level, which you all know. And I often wondered, how did the Mughal emperors live up there in the middle of the afternoon on a dust storm or a rain? And then I found out, you see these courtyards. If you look at the courtyards, they've got rings on the end of that. Do I have a, uh, some sort of uh, pointer I could get? On the edge of that profile around the courtyard. And what they would do, Oh, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, on the edge here. Yeah. Maybe that's the Taj, as you know, and that's the... And um, on the edge of that, so that in the morning, they could catch the cold air and trap it. And they would use these rooms during the day with the little windows, and in the evening they would come out here. And I would guess that in winter they did the opposite. They spent the day in the nice sunlight of Delhi, of North India. And in the evening when it was cold, they came down. So you're using different parts of the building at different times of the day or year. It's a nomadic way of dealing with climate. That was very common. I've seen, uh, it was very, I think even in America, you had in the um, Gimbal House, I think in, in Pasadena, the Green Brothers, they have big porches on the south side and then porches on the north side for sleeping at night because they stayed cool. They never got heat at the north side. So <coughs> it's, it's another way of dealing with climate. Now here's a third way. This is in Hyderabad Sin, but you get this in, in Iran too, in Yazd, where, the, you know, Corbusier said, a house is a machine for living. But, and I think Corbusier was a great, great architect. You can see that he influenced all of us. But I don't think he ever did anything as expressionistic as these houses, which catch the, the desert air and is pushed down into the basement where the air is humidified and then, then circulated in the house. And if you see the whole, oh gosh, what happened here? Yeah? Is the, what is happening? Well, the point is, yeah, the pointer didn't like what I was saying. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The pointer can switch it all off. It's dangerous. Okay. Thank you. You know, this is the whole town. You know, it reminds me of, you, you see these National Geographic things about some bird, birds which go and meet and the eggs are hatched on some island and then the vultures or some horrible birds come and all the all the little little chickens are squeaking away. Look at the look at the turmoil in the city and it's just wonderfully expressionist. So these kind of images I think um, form architecture and at least they influenced me a lot. And right from my first I think the first I think earliest, one of the earliest things was this tube housing in Ahmedabad for the Gujarat Housing Corporation, I guess, Housing Board. And we got the same uh, density as, as is in the uh, apartment house with narrow tube-like structures, which really were like a machine. It got up the hot air there. You could use different levels for sleeping, etc. There were no internal doors or windows. And, and that's how you could control the air coming in. 
Here's another thing I did about the time in 61. This is a Lieber's pavilion in the stand in Delhi. And here we used a, it was just a random plate. It's like a piece of paper actually, crumpled. And uh, the, in that time there were no computers, but a great, great engineer called Mahendra Raj, he designed this just by his, 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 his intuition. That's the, and you can see you can, you can walk, right? There's a way of going through it, of course. And this idea of how you move through a building and the, the kind of ritualistic pathway became very important. This is a, we use super graphics to give it scale. Yeah, and, and this was the inside of it. It was meant to be this kind of random thing. And at that time, we used to use also uh, steel shuttering and sometimes just wooden planks, which gives it a nice cinema verite kind of look. And we used all those ideas in this Ram Krishna house. Um, this is one of the big mill owners here. And it's got the same principles as the tube house. That means you get the parallel walls and then the top light which uh, takes the hot air out. I think both these two projects have been knocked down. <laughs> so the tube house was knocked down years ago and I think Ramakrishna house too was gone. Here's one in, in Bombay. Uh, those first few projects I showed you are for dry climates where you can trap the air and humidify it. But of course in um, in a, in a climate like Bombay, you've got to get through ventilation. Now here's an example, because all the time we were doing this brisole, one couldn't help noticing that the brisole, the concrete, protects you during the day when it's hot. But in the evening when it's cool, the concrete becomes a radiator, radiating heat. And then I noticed that the bungalow was very clever. The, the rooms are here, and you've got an, a veranda going around, the bathrooms, what have you, and there are two lines of defense. If you're in this room, you can close this door, or you can put down this chick this, some, on the veranda level. So it became a ring of service spaces, which you see clearly in this very primitive bungalow. I think this I took in Ahmedabad on the way to the air. Does it still exist, this, this house? No. Sad. Anyway, it's like the house that Adam built, you know, it just, it just tells you how you live in the tropics. But anyway, so, yeah, and I think one of the things which is very, very important, I think, to me, I'm not a historian, William would know better. Um, I think the veranda was the great creation as a social space of the colo co colonial past. This was the one contribution they did, I think, or the biggest, the big, bigger than Lachan's. Anyway. <coughs> this idea of using this servant space, service space, as a, also a, a, a way of going around. I shouldn't use this thing. But the trouble with the veranda, of course, is that you you can um, you you can look into the rooms. There's no privacy. So then I thought, what happens if we have a double height? and you have a garden there to protect you, etc., etc., and then you interlock it, and then you get two different levels. We have two levels here, one here, two here, one here. And then sometimes you can put, you can put four, two levels on either side, then you get a different, a bigger flat. And uh, then you pile them up, and then you, that is what Kanchenjunga done many years ago, is about. It's about trying to inform a building about truth. What it's, what it's doing in facing climate is also facing the two best views of Bombay, the Arabian Sea and the harbor, but protecting them through this secondary space. Those are the pockets. So you don't ever get glass right in the sunlight. Or this is the plan. It's a very simple plan. It's just a, a living room, dining room. This is the terrace. These are the lines of dressing rooms, bathrooms, verandas, which protect you. And the two sides are um, shear walls, which allow the cantilever. And this is overlooking the city. And you look across on the diagonal, so looking back at the building. 
this is a nice drawing. It shows the true ventilation right through, just by the manipulation of levels. And this is the two lines of defense. It's very, very important when we it used to be that this is what architecture was about in the in the warm climates. And cities and the buildings had a different look, and cities had a different look, because cities also dealt with layering. You have arcades. Now all that's gone. I mean, the, what's tragic is that in the north of the world, where it's very cold, they don't need spaces like this. They can't use them naturally for most of the year. And so they make their buildings with a big skin, like some sort of icebergs. And these icebergs have come floating down to our part of the world. And now you look at Singapore, and it doesn't look like a, like a tropical port city anymore. It could be anything anywhere. So it's not just the art buildings that have suffered by this colonization of our minds. It's our cities. But I want you as young students to start thinking for yourself about what a building could be given these reference points. This is Kanchin Jungle in the context of it. It's uh, other buildings around it. And uh, one thing I never mentioned before that I seldom mention it is that um, at the time we were designing it, I was reading somewhere about how people worry about the proportions of buildings. And I read that, uh, for instance, well, of course, Mies, but a square building like the um, World Trade Center, they tried. To, they had two towers flat, then they decided to make it square. And then they had proportions of three is to one, four is to one, five is to one, six is to one. And they chose five is to one. So this proportion is, I like four is to one. I mean, it's like a quarter, I like one and four. But it's the dumbest thing you can do is to make an apartment house which is square, because if it's flat, with the same area, you get more windows, you know that. So it was very tough keeping a square, because then we had to make these deep cutouts for the... I'm telling you this because a building isn't just something as simple as saying, oh, it's, tough. it's climate, oh, yes, it's structure, yes. It's many, many layers. And you have to keep moving around in your mind until you are happy about all the layers. Now this open to sky space, which is that terrace, which is so important, has huge implications for low income housing. Because if I live, the family lives in a little mud room over there. But this courtyard is in free room. Now, I think tomorrow we'll discuss it. I'm not going to discuss it today. The importance of space as a resource. Like you can give them the second room using brick, using mud, anything, or concrete. You can also give them space, a terrace, what have you. And there's a production cost for the, for the room as concrete, there's a production cost for the room as empty space because your services go up. And that trade-off, and we'll discuss it tomorrow, I think, because it's another set of issues. But I would like to point out that these issues are related between architecture and planning. We'll go into this, the whole system of spaces that make housing. But today, I think we'll just talk about the metaphysical aspects of open space. Like this lovely auditorium which ends in open space, the whole campus, the whole celebration of open space has huge, it has pleasure, but it also has great metaphorical meanings. The guru sitting under the tree, which I pointed out before, often is a symbol of education, quite different from the little red schoolhouse, but it's also the symbol of enlightenment. That's very important. No one's ever accused the, you know, the classroom as being enlightenment. It's instruction. This is open-ended because the sky above you is open-ended. So we we'll talk about that. And of course, it comes up in the context of Gandhiji and his house. You all know this, that he is the, just like this, Rishi, like the Lord Buddha, this Rishi under the tree. He's talking about more than the most, just, just the most mundane things in life. And I think the open veranda was very important for him. It's a traditional thing, but he needs that in order to communicate. 
and what he leaves behind is the the simplest things and uh, it's funny i think that gandhi ji had no aesthetic sense i'm sorry saying this in this city but just like mao tse tong i don't think you can accuse him of being but this is the most beautiful photograph i know of from that time it gives you the key to what how india could be go beyond poverty it's not poverty it's it's the wonderful minimalism of his life so in this building i thought we use the same materials as he as his house but in our own voice i don't want to him i don't think you 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 pay um homage to the how to the past by uh, making a caricature a cartoon of it you have to in speak with your own voice your own language and um, again we have the same thing that you know this building and just want to point out one thing to you it's a continuous pathway like gandhi ji is like they don't use it that way unfortunately and i tried to get them to and we actually read the whole and i didn't do this is jyotindra jain but it was turned down first it was accepted and turned down by whoever they are there at the ashram but the idea is that all these spaces connect and um, they were uh, you start with gandhi ji born and then you get south africa and then you get ahmedabad and then the national the, the movement the uh, gets into national politics and then finally he is assassinated and it's over and then you come here and you find no he's actually won because you got people like martin luther king you got people all over the world and so is he trapped so he's killed but i hope they implement that one day anyway so the architecture is very minimalist you know that the no there's no the ventilation just comes through these louvers it used to be very austere like that first picture i showed you but unfortunately now it's i don't know who run but it's not government run it's run by those people and they just mess it up they put things everywhere but it's still not the quality that's it that just village people can come in and feel at home they don't feel threatened by the building now you know i often and now we should discuss also what would be an architecture for india now the basis of most architecture in the world goes back to the greeks because of the spread of many things and for the for the greeks and for buse always said that that a building does not imitate nature it doesn't look like a tree but it it is man made but it has a dialogue with nature there is a back and forth and that principle came down from the greeks through the romans all the way into palladio and then it came to to corbusier and when corbusier as you know in in many of his books he refers back to that so this is a idea that the building does not imitate nature man made and is in conversation now i come down this line and all of you all of us come down this line to find an indian architecture do i turn left or to find a japanese one do i turn right it's absurd because you've come down a line which is already defined parameters which have nothing to do with india or japan and i think your task would be to try and see what would those bar- i mean i'm just as hazarding a guess if i look at the caves in ajanta what are they doing the caves are not dominating the hill but they're not leaving it alone i can't say they haven't touched the hill the a simplistic relationship yes or no is not there in that's why that's why buddhism or hinduism is quite different from what you get in the old testament or the new testament which is what finally defined palladio and corbusier the yes or no of western man i guess it goes back to the greeks so what kind of architecture would happen if you came down a pathway from there i think that's i hope what some of you try to find out and do succeed in finding out it would be quite different from coming down this pathway and turning left it doesn't work that way so one of the projects which i did which i never shown actually is this is uh, kasturba gandhi's 
Samadhi in Pune, which was done just about the same time as this one here, Gandhiji's was being constructed. Here I thought we'll make a non-building. I mean, I hadn't really analyzed it, I just felt it doesn't want a building, it wants a pathway. So it's on the edge of this garden of the Aga Khan Palace, where she died. And you get a kind of way of moving through it. You go under a bridge and that is her Samadhi, where, where she was, that existed. Or the other ways you can go through, you can go from there, you can go across, come down these steps, etc. That's the Samadhi I of you. Now you can stand on the platform and see the landscape. And then I did another one about 10 years later, Bharat Bhavan in, in Bhopal, where you enter, some of you may have been there, and you don't see anything, you don't see any building, but you get these walls which define the spaces you move through, which are the set of courtyards which ends with a view of the lake. And in the courtyards, you've got kind of entrances to different sections, unconnected to each other. And those who've got, some of them have got these top cannon lights. But really, it's a movement through the space, which is defined by those walls. Again, it's a place that the people of the city come to, very average people, they come, even middle class people on scooters, hold, and they, for the garden, they don't come for the museum, but they stay to look at the museum, which is very nice. So they, this, this is, um, I just put in this clip because it's an impossible building to photograph because you can't photograph what isn't there. That's what, that's what a friend of mine said. But um, just by moving through the spaces, you, it, and some sort of, it's more like an energy field. It's not really, a, 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 an object you look at. It's a field you move through. And finally, of course, at the end of it all, the, the, the lake. And then other things I tried to do, this was um, um, in Jaipur. I will use some, many of you may have seen it, so I wouldn't bother with it. It's, it's, um, it's the city which was based on the Navagraha, which is also an energy field, the nine planets. And as you know, I think Kulbushin Jain said this, but um, that this actually, because of the hill, it was moved this way, but some scholars say, no, that's not correct. But most scholars agree with him that the plan was nine squares, which with this one moved over. You can see that. It was the nine planets. And um, so I, I took that because Nehru was, I thought it was wonderful that Jai Singh was trying to design a city which was both looking backwards in, to the mandala and forward to science because he's the one who really brought scientific instruments to India. I mean, the second time in the world that they'd ever been done, the Jantar Mantar. And so, he in that sense, he was the first modern Indian like Nehru was, that he was trying to look both ways like you people have to do, and yet with one gesture, not with schizophrenia, but making, healing it. And uh, they come together. What you get here, it, it intrigued me also because the mandala suggests quite a different handling of space. Because the only connection between these nine planets, which are quite different in their character, is this one opening, which is three meters. 10 feet, and this is 30 meters, the planet itself. So, when I step from one into the other, I step from one world into quite another one. And uh, you would never get that if you had antechambers. Usually architecture has big rooms, small rooms, big rooms. This is just bang, 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 it just adds up. So, it's a different sense of space. And because the em center is empty, you know where you are. Otherwise, you would go mad because you know which planet you were in. But every time you look through this opening, you know I'm this side. It's Orient. So then I realized the emptiness in the center is just, not, I'm not talking about religion at all. I'm talking about how the human mind is structured. An empty center becomes a source of energy of the building. It energizes the whole building, like a courtyard does. 
me that was a tremendous revelation. This was not just some sort of, and I wasn't interested in the religious part of it, obviously. I was just curious to know what it does in terms of space architecturally. So it is a, it's, it's a contemporary building, but using the oldest myths. This, this is Krishna, this is a man, this is Guru, which is the library, of course. And that's it. It's a, it's a kind of model of the cosmos in a way. It is that actually, but a contemporary building based on the oldest ideas of the cosmos. And at the same time, we did this one, which is a building, well, it's a campus in, in Pune of astronomy and astrophysics, and it's based on the newest ideas of the cosmos, of modern science. That means you're trying to express the black hole, the, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the, the um, uh, infinite universe, etc. Infinitely expanding. How do I move this from here? Oh, yeah, and um, so again, you get the walls and then the center. And then this was the, I mean, how do you symbolize science? That last one in Jaipur had uh, the, the cosmograph, which is the idea of the, the non-manifest world. But the scientists who played a huge role in this building, they said we would like to put the precise precision of the stars the day we started or the night we started. So that's what the, that is. Because, because the, the science deals in, in uh, in uh, accuracy and in measurement and in calibration and that's what this they said we tried to celebrate here this for instance is the Foucault's pendulum which is all the time moving and it tells you the movement of the earth it just goes on and on or oh, this of course was a yantra for measuring the stars and the sun etc now another thing which informs your building is the context these are all different layers which have to come in your mind. This is their building at MIT. It's, um, it's in an industrial area. That's Frank Gehry's building across data center. And we were given this site, which is actually two sites and a railway track. And they wanted three institutes. And so this would be one way to do it. But I decided on this because by lining this up, you have much more flexibility between the three institutes. But secondly, by running it this way, you quieten down the street, because otherwise, uh, Frank's building across the road is a very exuberant one, and I thought we have to be very quiet to not, otherwise the whole street would disintegrate. So usually I would have made something wilder than this, but I kept this like this, and then I noticed since Main Street comes at an angle, it means these corridors give you a chance. Here it comes. You see the way it's fitting in between all these buildings. These are existing buildings at MIT, which is a mess in this area. This is Gary's building. And you can see that um, what I've tried to do, see, like, because of this diagonal, whenever we want to, we can cantilever a room out right over the, it just floats out over the, the main street. Looks Fantastic, uh, your office is there. But it's, it's not something which has been added as a gimmick. It comes out of the structure of the plan. You, know, you can see some of these, but this is on Main Street, where the building is all the time proceeding, telling you that it's got a different geometry. And this is from the other street, which is where it's flat. Here we go, you can see the difference. Now, here the context actually, form the building. The building had its own internal things too. That's the corner where they meet. That's the atrium which goes over the railway track. This is where the scientists meet. We've got lots of places where they meet and talk to each other. They're called tea rooms. And this is the bulges which come because of the, the, the geometric struggle that is going on inside between the two geometries. Uh, the grid and then the diagonal. 
and you have a train coming out from under the building. Now, the, uh, this is the last project I'll show you. Um, it's the one in, in Lisbon. It's a center for, for um, cancer and, and brain disease and going blind. And it had a beautiful site. I didn't know these people. They just inherited 500 million euros to put up this project by a man, the richest man in Portugal. And uh, they knew it had to be for science. And, and they had this wonderful site. This is Belém, which is the one of the oldest parts of Lisbon. And uh, this is where the town of Belém, which is from where the navigators left. And uh, this was our site. And it just had some sheds and was a government site. And when I went to see it that day, I, I mean, I didn't want to do this project, but they, when they told me they had this site, I thought, okay, maybe I should go and see it. And it was raining, and then I could only walk along the edge, on the, along that curve, you know, this curve out here. We couldn't go in there. And um, I kept asking the director, I want to see where the river becomes the ocean, because that's when they... And um, he said, just a little further, a little further. And it never happened, and he had to come back. But I knew that if I did this project, I have to connect the point of entry with the ocean. I don't know, um, that's very, very important. In fact, that's the nicest thing about Sauk. I think the way those two buildings connect you and you think you're, you're looking all the way to China or something. You're not actually just looking into a little part of California. But um, I thought we must see that you, when you come, when you enter the site, that you're really, not. and then, of course, it immediately struck me that if you're there, you can't have another walkway there. And so I made it three walls. And behind each wall, of course, the, the built form occurs, and then the connections between them. This is the main building, which is um, the, um, where the treatment is. The treatment is doctors and scientists and patients. And um, this is a subsidiary building which has offices and it has an auditorium and stuff. And this is an amphitheater which is given over to the city. So 50% of the site is given back to the city to use to, to celebrate what is a historic site and a, his, a moment of the, I think the defining moment of their history. But I'm very proud that it doesn't use any kits. There's no tide roofs, nothing. It's all talking about what happened, but in present terms and and try to draw an analogy between the courage of the, of the scientists who try to find a cure for cancer, etc., and for those navigators. They both go into the unknown, and that's why the owners of it, they decided to call it the Center for the Unknown. This is, I think this you just saw in the movies. You don't have to see this again. Did you all just see this? No? This is just a fly-through, then I'll show you a real movie on it. These are the three buildings. What I was trying to do was use the architecture as therapy. Using the sky as therapy, the sea itself. So you don't, you're not with, you usually poor cancer patients are put into a basement. Here you've got terraces, you've got sunlight, and you've got two floors where the, the lower two floors are for the patients and the upper two for the scientists who work on the same problem as the doctors. And, and the, so the, the, it's called, a, it's a new way of working. And then we've got this glass bridge which connects the two. And then it, that's the walk towards the ocean, towards the river. And, I, and I, I sloped this, I put this on a slant. So when you walk, you see the sky. And that's the most enigmatic thing of all. And that's an object in this water, which is just a small pool, which is, could be anything. It could be a, I don't know, an island or anything you want. It's what you go and search out.
and uh, this is given to the city so the students can, and other people they have concerts there, rock concerts or some some discussion or maybe a, 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 a lecture on science yeah, and, and that's the river becoming the ocean out there. Now I, I told, showed you what went before because if I hadn't done those earlier buildings I wouldn't have gone, I mean as you get older and as you get to be an architect, you yourself, you'll find in your brain, in your mind, in your hand, you're accumulating attitudes, which you don't realize, but are there. So when you get later on, you design a project, rightly or wrongly, you're informed by everything that went before. This is just some shots of the, of this is the glass bridge, which was done by a brilliant German engineer called Schlick. Um, this is the sorry. This is the two buildings. You can see that the the buildings themselves are all orthogonal, and they've got they're very practical and sensible. But by with by taking that instead of just making a rectangle, you then get the gardens, which are very very important because they like the building, they protect it, and they create two different zones. One is for the for the workings of the of the foundation of the of the of the medical part and the other for the public. In fact, uh, then of course to get that we had to actually what helped us a tremendous lot was Google because when you draw you you find when you look at the Google map you find you're looking at something quite stupid and banal across the river. So we had to curve this thing around, and so a lot of this is done as you as you're going along this is checking angles this is the wall going up and one of the exciting things in architecture you know when a painter goes to paint and they get it wrong they just scrape it off or they take another canvas if we get our first gesture wrong oh you need dynamite you know <laughs> so the day you go on the site and you realize my god i've been lucky because it's a huge building but this curve lets it sit very lightly on the side. And it had to be big because it, it, is, it, is, it is something which... So this is the way it looks and then what you want to end up with of course is this. You want to end up with something which has direction, clarity, etc. I'll just show you these. It's like a big piece of cheese which you cut. This is the, the end which is where the services are, but even that we try to keep, because it's basically, these things are right in the most prominent public area. I should just mention that I purposely used forms which are incomplete. So it's very enigmatic. You, you, you think that something's missing and you try to complete it, and then you, after some time, you give up. <laughs> you surrender to the building. But anyway, this is looking in. I hope this is going to be, when it's finished, growing. It's already grown much more than there's a garden inside. I thought one of the things, if you ever got cancer, you would want to see, I would like to see a Brazilian rainforest. I'd like to see nature, which is so fecund, which is so, that's bigger than anything of any of us. I would like to see the sky, the sea, etc. And these are the things which form the therapy of the building. And then because of the transparency, you get the startling views. This is the thing a little bit towards the end of construction. That's the auditorium at the end here. That's the cutouts to them. This is from inside the auditorium looking on. It's not glass, it's plexiglass. It's, it's, five pieces which are joined together flawlessly. And it was done by the Chinese. <laughs> no one, even the Japanese couldn't do this. But when the Chinese did it, they put curtains on either side and they worked only at night and they wouldn't let, and what they did, we don't know. But when they removed the curtains, I'm serious, I'm not fooling. I'm not fooling, it was, because it's a, many people come and all they remember is, how did they get that piece of glass in place? Actually, it was five pieces. This is the different parts of the building. Then looking down from here at the garden, this is the way the, 
scientists work here, and then they cross here to their offices and the doctors here. So there's a lot of interchange between them. And you can see how the sections go. Because you get gardens at different levels very easily. I mean, nothing is forced in this building. And when you get it, the right, I, I find, if it's the right idea, it designs itself. When you're struggling with the design, you, I, I, I find I've started wrongly. A building should design itself, like a song should write itself. I read something the other day, someone said, you start a song, a popular song, you only have to let it find, start singing. You don't say, oh, let's go to that note. You, the song sings itself. And I think that's true in architecture. You have to, when, when we have struggling, very often, it's because maybe we've started with the wrong idea. And so these terraces, they all came up easily. I could find place for the gardens. And interestingly enough, this is very close to the first slide I showed you that is in south, southern Spain, which is right next to Lisbon. That was Granada. So the principle of having gardens, which then protect you, protect the spaces, is a very old one. But this, of course, is not nothing to, doesn't look anything like Granada, and it shouldn't. This is a, one of the therapy courtyards. Actually, I fell in this courtyard and broke, broke my hip. That's why I'm limping around. And uh, so I was the first victim of this building because it was, <laughs> you know, and for some reason, the, you know, the Portuguese and the Spanish, they still have bullfights. So they have a sense of blood and primordial things, you know, and uh, everyone else has abolished bullfights, I think, or maybe never had them. So when they see that the architect has shed blood. <laughs> I'm serious, they're so extra nice to you. And I thought probably that in the old days, whenever a building, a major building was opened, some blood, some chicken was killed or some, or maybe the architect, someone got killed. <laughs> so it, it, was, it was a mixed blessing to, and I had to be rushed to this emergency thing, etc. Anyway, this is wonderful, the president of the uh, for the opening was by the president of the country, but the president of the foundation, who's a very smart woman, she climbed up and with one of these felt pens, she wrote the foundation ceremony thing, just as graffiti. I mean, when she climbed up on a big stool, because I thought she'd fall, but secondly, I didn't know how she'd have the guts. It's like Corbusier or Picasso, just to write, knowing that you get it right, which she did. Yeah, and then of course it's a much richer building than what I showed you because of the connections and the way you go from one level to the other and looking out. This is looking back to the city. This is the bridge. And these are these openings. And that's the walkway. And then to announce the ocean and the, that, is, that wonderful thing, I wanted to put two uh, 60, that's 20 meter high, 18 meters high uh, pieces of granite, which you can get in Portugal, but we couldn't transport them to the site because of traffic. So we finally did it in concrete with blue cement at the top. So it disappears into the sky. And then in the water, you can see that, that object, which is what we go in search of. The unknown. Thank you. Thank you.
found this is not a museum of modern art. On the contrary, it's a place of cutting edge science and medicine where people come with real problems, suffering from cancer, from brain disease, from going blind. And we try to help them by using the architecture itself as therapy. The sea is therapy, the sky, nature itself. Beauty is therapy, really. Beginnings lie in the will of the man who was a great entrepreneur, actually a genius. And his uh, job, the Banshee Babu, his name, had created a foundation which was dedicated to human health. He was a man perfect <coughs> for results. He certainly wanted his money, his wealth, in areas where we would make a difference in preventing and treating disease. And uh, so we came to this idea, what is called translation science. So knowledge, which is used uh, to uh, have results, which in our case would be about preventing and treating disease. Two main choices. 
cancer and neuroscience. The cancer program aims at um, doing clinical research and applied research in order to achieve innovations and uh, better results in the treatment of cancer as a whole, aiming at uh, the control of the disease and ultimately the cure of cancer. In order to do research, you must have uh, not only doctors with their mindsets prepared to do research, but also you must uh, interact continuously with um, investigators of more basic and fundamental sciences. That goes from biology to biochemistry to physics to mathematics uh, to bioinformatics to biostatistics and so on. And then to translate those knowledges into the uh, bed of the patient, into the patient again. And that's what we call, or is called generally, translation of research. Cancer patients can now benefit from very advanced and effective means of treatment, both in the field of chemotherapy and uh, radiation therapy. And radiation therapy is one of those fields that has advanced the most uh, utilizing uh, cutting edge uh, technology. We have been able, over the past few years, to uh, implement uh, this technology in such a way that we can spare the critical organs, the organs that would normally uh, suffer from the treatment, in a way that the treatments can result in uh, excellent cure rates with minimal complications. <coughs> In the neuroscience part of the research, we want to understand how the brain works, and especially how it produces behavior, how it does all these marvelous things that allow us to be ourselves, how is it that it can help us perform a simple action like reaching for a glass of water, how it enables us to talk and say meaningful things or sometimes not so meaningful. So we want to understand how is this all happening in the brain, how it emerges uh, in the brain, and what are the specific circuits inside the brain or the molecules that generate all the behavior that uh, we have and we see in the animal world. We don't know where the land will be found. We, we're going beyond the horizon. We're trying to go beyond the horizon. And it would be foolish for us to all send our, our our emissions in exactly the same place when we don't know uh, where we'll, we'll find uh, a, a true discovery. The interaction between basic science and clinic is one of the most challenging aspects in, in, in modern science. Typically, in many places, people are in separate buildings or institutions. This building that we are in was designed to facilitate that interaction. The way that things are designed around here it leads not only to formal interaction, but to informal, casual interaction. And I think that's a very important first aspect. The space here uh, includes a lot of open shared areas. And some enclosed places that are also shared. This, per se, promotes interaction between them. The, the challenge is that, of course, if you have interaction all the time, you cannot have peace of mind to work. So there are also some more secure places, and the functional organization of the place is still evolving, still dynamic, because we are occupying it. Uh, so the structure where we are, helps interaction, that's the first thing. The building per se is very beautiful, and it is a statement. So typically buildings for science are <coughs> traditional, they are not uh, especially beautiful or especially inviting. To have a building like this in a country like Portugal, a small country with 
difficult is the investment in science. It's a statement. It's something that doesn't go unnoticed. So when I come here and sometimes I'm discouraged and I see there is a statement, a solid statement that even if I feel like, oh, I can't work very well this week or, you know, these uh, such and such things are not working so well, so you feel discouraged, there's a statement saying, this is something to stop. to turn left and go down towards the coast of Africa. You know, they probably got the maps from the Moors, for instance. I mean, the Moors must have the, the Muslims have this idea of that whole part of the world. But no European had ever gone that way. And so it was a journey into the unknown. And uh, as a wonderful metaphor for what science says, it is a journey into the unknown. So when I saw the site, I knew we must, we must actually make that that connection. But another thing happened when I first saw the site. It was evening. I just come in from Bombay and I was on my way somewhere else. It was raining. The, the gate was locked. So we had to walk along the curve out there. And uh, I said, I want to see where the river joins the ocean. And uh, Jao said, it's just a little further. And a little further and we never found it. Because it was rain was coming down. We had no overcoats. But I think that was very important because since I didn't experience the, 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 the site except along the curve, I was very aware of the, of the curve of the site. When I went to sleep that night in the hotel, I knew we must make a project that when you enter it, you are aware that there's an ocean out there, that there's this world of, which you have of the unknown, and you have to have the courage to go and see it. So it really is celebrating the history of Portugal. I would think the defining moment, you could arguably, the defining moment of their history. And yet it is done in the context of new work to be done. How can we work in here? 
in terms of uh, the clinical activity that we usually do in a very, in a much more conventional, uh, let's say, building. And the first ideas in order to organize the functional areas of the clinic, we thought we must change a lot of things. And then, as the time uh, was passing, we became realizing that that was not the case. Because in fact, we don't need to change anything. We just uh, need to adapt to the building. And particularly in oncology, as you know, one of the main um, areas of treatment is the administration of chemotherapy which is uh, sometimes a very long, tedious, and uh, painful, let's say, sometimes, uh, procedure. And for that, we have a place that doesn't look like a hospital. You, you sit in a chair that you feel like you are at home, you can see your TV program or work in your computer, have your friend uh, uh, beside you. So it's, it's, again, something that can be done without um, creating uh, what uh, is conventional hospital atmosphere. And that's a big success, I, I, I can say. And we are increasingly recognizing a very well thought um, building um, in order to achieve precisely what we are doing. It's a marvelous building. Working in the building and coming to understand the architecture is something that takes a long time. There are many elements to the building that you only begin to appreciate after you have been living in them for, for some time. So we've been here now two years, a bit more than two years, and I still feel very much as if I'm discovering things about uh, the place. And this is the same uh, case for working uh, in, in any other great building like, like the Salk. But this place makes an immediate impression, and especially from the outside or in the, the spaces near here where the, the uh, window opens onto the sea. Um, it's a dramatic building, no doubt. sort of the shape of a ship departing and, and has the big windows of the ship. Now in modern world, we know a lot about the geography of the earth, but there are a lot of unknowns. So I imagine this ship departing to understand what our brain is and uh, what, how to in, improve treatment for cancer. And so this is another, it's, it's a metaphor, but you work inside the metaphor. sculpture for use, for human use. And so it has the openings for light, air, doors, windows, and it's very important that those openings don't spoil the sculpture, but they make it more perfect, more beautiful. It has the gestures of human occupation. That is what architecture is about. They're really creating this pathway to, to the Atlantic Ocean, which is uh, the whole point of the site. And uh, the nice thing about these walls is that they also divide the site into 
in the public areas, which is given back to the city of Lisbon, to the citizens, to come and enjoy this place. And then the semi-private areas, which is where the science and the medicine takes place. And they coexist in a kind of thing which the Chinese call yin-yang, which is wonderful. Both yin and yang, one is positive, one is negative, are equally important. So the public space here is 50% of the site given back to the city by the foundation, but it still keeps enough for, the, for this work, research work to go on. And uh, these walls with their big cutouts, etc., allow enough privacy for the public. They don't feel that they're disturbing patients. And for the patients, they have enough privacy that they don't feel they have people looking at them. And this all comes from really very old principles. And of course, at the end of this walkway is where you, you reach the river and then the ocean. But first you see this body of water. So you have this enigmatic object in it. It could be an island, it could be a, it could be a jellyfish, a Portuguese man of war. It's what you go in search of. It's what drives you to discover. So that is the analogy which ties the, the great navigators to today's scientists, both here in Portugal, both on the same side.
Thank you so much sir, for sharing your work with us today. Um, it really brings us all immense joy to see you in person here with us in our midst today, sharing your work with us. I think for many of us, your work has served, if I may use the term used by Mr. Curtis yesterday, um, as a mirror and a lens through which we try to understand the architecture for most of us here today. Um, thank you so much. Thank you to all the people who have gathered here today and to all the students especially who have come down from all parts of India and South Asia. To all our participating students, thank you so much for coming here today and have a good evening. Thank you.